Good morning, everybody. Good morning, church. We can start because I see my scripture reader today. Our scripture reader has arrived, so that's good. That is good news. So welcome, everyone. I see a few folks still getting settled, which is fine. Welcome to everyone who's joining us in person and those of you who are joining online. So we do gather from near and far in this place virtual and three-dimensional as St. David's and Northminster United Churches who worship and partner together. Um, this month, June, is Pride Month and around the world I've been looking at the pictures of people celebrating with pride and it's a beautiful thing to see. Of course, you know, many of you, that we celebrate Pride in Calgary in September and if you've been even a little bit conscious over the last couple of weeks, you know exactly why. <laughs> because we get rained on in June. So, but it is, uh, it is Pride Month, so happy Pride to everyone. Um, today is also a very special day because it's Father's Day. So I want to start out today by wishing the fathers, the uncles, the brothers, the father figures, the big cousins, uh, those who lead and protect and guide with their strength and wisdom and compassion. Happy Father's Day. And so, of course, not all of us have had that experience with the men in our lives, but we are happy to honor those men who fill in the gaps where perhaps we lacked and who show us uh, in their kindness that there are many ways to be masculine and many ways to love. So, thank you, fathers. Today is also the Indigenous Day of Prayer Sunday, and uh, <laughs> I see my beautiful son is wearing a magpie feather in his hair, and uh, I hope that we all carry the spirit of the earth and the creatures and our wonderful, beautiful Indigenous Métis and uh, Inuit siblings with us today. Um, I want to just mention that as you follow along in the program, some of the things that, we had, that I had planned for today, we cannot do. Uh, a couple of the videos may have been subject to copyright, and so they've been removed from the service. So I ask you to fear not, you're still in my capable hands, and uh, we'll, we'll find our way. And so everything that you'll need today is either in the PowerPoint, or there will be times, I promise you, in your Protestant natures that it's not written down, but it's going to be okay. So <laughs> just stick with me, we'll be all right. And of course, the children and youth will be invited uh, after our um, video of a story and a song to send them off to go off to Kids Zone. So, welcome. Let us begin this morning by lighting our candles. Um, you'll see that I have the wonderful Ruth. Uh, I feel like since I started at St. David's, we've been a good team <laughs> of lighting the candles. And even now with a sling, she won't let me down. So <laughs> today we're going to begin our worship in a good way by acknowledging the land. And this land where we live, where the Bow River meets the elbow, has been stewarded since time immemorial by the indigenous people of this region. Today we gather on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, the Pikani, and the Kainai Nations, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley Nations, and the Tsutsina Nation. Southern Alberta is also home to the Métis region of Alberta, sorry, Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And so by lighting our candle, our Treaty, 3, Treaty 7 Métis Region 3 candle, we acknowledge that we strive to be in right relationship with the land, with creation, and with all peoples who make this place home. This is a deep kind of reconciliation, and it requires our empathy, our humility, and our repentance. May it be so. And then we move to light our pride candle, saying this prayer. God of infinite manifestations, free us from shame that confines and judgment that destroys. Bring healing to the wounds of our being and being told that we are too big or too much, too feminine or too butch, too young or too old or too queer. 
ground us in the truth that sets us free. We are the work of a divine hand. The holy lives within our flesh. Wherever we struggle to believe, meet us there. Move our bodies with joy and purpose. And finally, a centering prayer as we call Christ into our worship today. Holy One, breath of the Big Bang, idea of creation, you who make spring rains and summer rains come forth. You who make life out of nothing, breathe yourself into me, into all of us. Create us. You are the flame, we are your light. You are the nerve, we are your muscle. You are the word, we are the story. You are the song, we are the singing. Let us be one with you and one with all creation, one spirit, one flesh, many forms. In your spirit, I become we. Holy one, live in me. I am your body, we are your body. And so we remember this and we live once more. So come, let us worship. The artists, the queer folks, the children, the outraged, the caregivers, the organizers. Amidst a world groaning with destruction, not at a distance, but dwelling right here with us. Hallelujah. So today in our worship, folks, we're going to explore healing, honesty, and earthly and divine power. We bring our own lives into this. We bring our personal anxieties, our joys, our pain and our pleasure, our seeking and our knowing. All of it we bring into this place so that we might become one in community, so that we might be able to praise and to protest, so that we might rest here and recover. All of this vast spectrum of our humanity we place in God's infinite and loving embrace. And so let us pray. Great comforter, pray with me. We gather to share in God's dream of abundant life for all. We gather to give and receive gifts of deep emotion, deep wisdom, and deep love. With gratitude, we gather as a community to praise God, to seek transformation, and to celebrate the power of the Spirit who is always moving. God, we know that we are surrounded by a legacy of pain. We acknowledge the pain, grief, and sorrow caused by not living respectfully with all people. And we are sorry for the ways that we have dishonored the depths of this pain. Open us, Creator, to the power of interconnectedness. Help us to receive the painful stories as well as the inspiring stories. Grant us the courage to own any feelings of vulnerability, shame, fear, and guilt that may come from our interactions with each other. And with your healing grace, Lead us through our aching toward your dream of wholeness. Transform our community, O oh God, so, and us, so that we may see ourselves and those who we deem other through your eyes. Inspire our vision and our action to imagine and participate in breaking open a reality where no sibling, be they two-legged, four-legged, the creeping or the flying ones, None of them are recognized as anything other than your beloved. Place in our hearts today no smaller vision of reconciliation than this. Amen. And so we will go straight on to our prayer of confession. And I ask that you pray this with me as well. We come seeking God in mighty earthquakes. 
We come listening for God in resounding thunder. We come expecting God in sweeping victories. Yet God is found in a baby's touch. Yet God speaks in silence. Yet God is found in the least of these. Save us, O God, from our aimless wandering. Save us, O God, from our idols. Save us, O God, from our chaos. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Hear the good news of God's love for us, not in the earthquake, not in the storms, not in the mighty deeds, but in the silence, in the gentle touch, in the quiet rain, the surrender. And know that God says again and again to each and every one of you who hear my voice, you are my beloved. I love you. And so now we're going to listen to a story. Uh, the name of the story is Auntie. Oh, we're sorry, we're going to sing a song. Oh, no, this, we're not singing a song. We're going to listen to the story first. <laughs> then we're going to sing a song. Hello and welcome back to another edition of Sankofa Read Aloud. Today's story is titled, Anti-Racist Baby, written by Ibram X. Kendi, illustrated by Ashley Lukashevsky. I hope that you enjoy this amazing story. Anti-Racist Baby is bred, not born. Anti-racist baby is raised to make society transform. Babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. There's no neutrality. Take these nine steps to make equity a reality. Number one, open your eyes to all skin colors. Anti-racist baby learns all of the colors, not because race is true. If you claim to be colorblind, you deny what's right in front of you. Number two, use your words to talk about race. No one will see racism if we only stay silent. If we don't name racism, it won't stop being so violent. Number three, Point at policies as the problem, not the people. Some people get more while others get less because policies don't always grant equal access. Number four, shout, there's nothing wrong with the people. Even though all races are not treated the same, we are all human. Anti-racist baby can proclaim. Number five, celebrate all our differences. Anti-racist baby doesn't see certain groups as better or worse. Anti-racist baby loves a world that's truly diverse. Number six, knock down the stack of cultural blocks. Anti-racist baby appreciates how groups speak, dance, and create as they choose. Anti-racist baby welcomes all groups voicing their unique views. Number seven, confess when being racist. Nothing disrupts racism more than when we confess the racist ideas that we sometimes express. Number eight, grow to be an anti-racist. Anti-racist baby is always learning, changing, and growing. Anti-racist baby stays curious about all people and isn't all knowing. Number nine, believe we shall overcome racism. Anti-racist baby 
is filled with the power to transcend, my friend, and doesn't judge a book by its cover, but reads until the end. Have a seat. So I'm not sure who's going with the kids today. Is there someone that's going with them? No? Okay. Uh, well, stay with us. <laughs> stay with us, hang out. Yeah? Oh, and phone's ringing. Okay, it's okay. It's all okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, maybe I was out of the loop about that. I apologize. Um, well, <laughs> let us hear from God this morning. We're going to hear uh, Psalm 42 and 43 sung uh, by these wonderful women here behind me, and uh, I'm looking forward to that, so let's hear that.
So at this time, I'll invite uh, Bernard to come and read the gospel lesson for today. And Bernard's going to read from the indigenous translation of the New Testament. I'll move my things. There you go. The reading was taken from Luke 8. Healing demons. When they finished crossing, they came to the territory of the people of honored in the end, Gadarenes, across the lake of circle of nations, Sea of Galilee. As soon as he stepped from the canoe, a man from the village was there. The man had been tormented with evil spirits for a long time. His clothes had worn off him and he was homeless. So he lived in the local burial grounds. When the man saw Creator set free Jesus, he fell to the ground in front of him. The evil spirit cried out through the man, Creator set free Jesus, son of the one above all. What do you want with me? I beg you not to torment me. He said this because Creator set, set free Jesus had ordered the evil spirit to leave the man. In the past, this evil spirit had often taken hold of the man, so the villagers had kept the man bound with chains and on a close watch. But the man had broken the chains and the evil spirit had forced him out into the desert. Creator set free, Jesus asked, What is your name? Many soldiers, he answered, because thousands of spirits had entered into him. They begged him not to send them into the deep dark pit of the world below. There was a large herd of pigs feeding on a nearby mountainside, so the spirits begged him to permit them to enter the pigs. When he gave them permission, the evil spirits left the man and entered into the herds of pigs. Then the whole herd stampeded down the mountainside headlong into the lake and drowned. The ones who were watching over the pigs were scared to death and ran away. They went to the nearby village and told them everything that had happened. As word spread, people came from the villages and the countryside to see for themselves. They, there they found the man whom the evil spirit had come out of, sitting quietly at the feet of Creator set free, Jesus. He was clothed in his right mind. This filled the hearts of the people there with awe and fear. The ones who had seen what happened told the people how the man with evil spirit had been set free. Then the people from the territory of the honored in the end of gatherings begged Creator set free Jesus to go away from their land. As Creator set free Jesus entered the canoe to return to the other side, the man who had been set free from the evil spirit begged him to take him along. Creator set free Jesus would not permit it and said to the man, return home to your family and friends. He told the man, tell them all the powerful things that great spirit has done for you. The man went, that, went his way and told his story in the villages telling everyone the great things great set free Jesus had done for him. (laughs) 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and see if there is any destructive way in me, and when you discover what is there that does not bring life, that does not reflect your image in me, remove it, O God, and cast it away to the sea of forgetfulness. Lead me in the way everlasting. May the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight, Creator. For you, Holy One, divine life, are my rock and my redeemer. Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit, do thy will. I love this story, um, and clearly the gospel writers did too, because it appears several times uh, in the gospels. This is an important story, I think, uh, for these times and let's explore why. It's important to note that at the beginning of the story, Jesus leaves his land and goes into Gentile territory. In this beginning of the story, we already get a sense of where Jesus is going and what Jesus does. Jesus crosses boundaries Jesus goes where he is needed, and Jesus heals. It's important, too, that we note at the beginning of this story uh, two important descriptors. One is that this is a place where pigs live. Uh, and two, this man who is tormented, this man who is chained and cutting himself daily and driven out of his mind is so marginalized, so on the outskirts that he is living in a cemetery. So I don't think we all have to be Old Testament scholars, Hebrew Bible scholars, to know that a rabbi, a teacher, like Jesus was, has no business being in a cemetery or adjacent to a pig farm. So this is right away indicators that Jesus was doing other than what other rabbis and teachers would have done. Just being there would make Jesus as a Jewish person ritually unclean. And it's important that we note that because Jesus goes willingly into this place. Nobody makes him go. And when he gets there, he finds this man who is plagued by demons. He is self-harming. He is distraught. He is shackled. Shackled by chains, shackled by society. It says in the text that the people were trying to keep him from harming himself, and so they chained him. And while that may, on one sense, in one sense, make sense, imagine what it is to be in chains and told that it's for your own good. I don't think it makes the chains any lighter. I think of the psalm here. In the psalm it says, My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, people mock me and say, Where is your God? I don't know if you have ever felt that type of desperation, where tears are your only food day and night, and people mock you for your belief. But I think about this man, and I think about how he relates to who we are and where we are today. And I love that at this point, Jesus, we're told, just simply says to him, what is your name? Here the man is begging, don't torment me. He already sees Jesus as a man who is in power, above him, perhaps, in station in life, and thinks that 
Somebody like that would only be there to make his life worse. And he begs Jesus, do not torment me. And Jesus simply says, what is your name? And the man says, in the original text, legion. Uh, in the indigenous text, many soldiers. And I think it's important to stop here because it is telling of the time. In first century uh, Jerusalem, in first century Near East, the legion of many soldiers would have been the Roman soldiers, and a legion was 10,000 is the number. So it is a statement of politics that the demon is named legion. Now, <clears throat> I think back to uh, my first year at seminary, and I took a homiletics course, preaching course, and my preaching professor is a good Methodist from Duke University, and he said, never, ever, ever try to explain, disprove, or rationalize a miracle in your sermon. If you do that, which many people do, I will disown you as my student. So I won't be doing that today. Because I think it's enough for us to believe that Jesus' ministry is a healing one. And I think that we can hear the call in this text to make sure that our ministry is also a healing ministry. And so, what is being healed here? In the first century, as I said, the word legion referred to a fleet of Roman soldiers. And whether the man's condition is supernatural or psychological, it's actually irrelevant. Because the reality is that at this time that the story is being told, everybody in the story fully believed that Roman oppression and spiritual oppression were inextricably linked. From this view, Rome simply represented the latest physical manifestation of demonic powers that had oppressed the Jews already for centuries. And so we see Jesus in this story acting to alleviate that oppressive suffering. He's there to heal, he's there to be with, to show up. So you may have noticed in the uh, bulletin this morning, if you looked at it, that there's a seed of meditation. And the seed of meditation is a recounting of a story. You don't have to look, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you what it says. Um, there's a recounting of a story by a, a preacher that I look up to quite a lot. His name is Otis Moss III. He uh, is a United Church of Christ minister in Chicago. He leads the biggest United Church of Christ in the United States uh, called Trinity. And he's telling a story about this text. Pardon me telling a story about this text, and he says, talks about a grandmother, Chicago, tough grandma, who says to her grandson, who's addicted to drugs, son, until you name the demon, you ain't never gonna be free. And I think that's really wise, sage, grandmotherly advice. Although for today, I could probably make her a grandfather. So let's make her a grandfather. <laughs> But nonetheless, the, uh, the advice stays the same. It's important that we name the demon. And so we have to name the demon today. Who is it in today's 21st century world? What is it, who is it that inflicts spiritual and physical oppression? Is it a person? Is it a system? Well, I think lots of people would have spirited conversations about what they think in their point of view, but since I'm the one preaching today, I'm gonna tell you what I think the demon's name is. I think that the demon has, for a long time, been one of white supremacy, patriarchy, a belief that there is one way to be ideal and close to God. 
and that all those who do not fit into that must either be broken down and assimilated or driven out of their natural born mind trying to do so. And I think for a long time the church has aligned itself with this kind of demonic activity. And that's why today when we prayed our prayer of confession, we repent. We seek to reconcile with the truth of God's healing ministry because the reality is, is that we cannot liberate and tell the truth about who God is and who we are in God's eyes if we stay married and mingled to a demon that harms and takes life and deals death to others. So I think it's interesting to note that in the story, even the demon who has complete control of this man's mind and body at this point recognizes the presence of liberation and healing. He speaks to Jesus with deference. And so it's not enough really to say that this is sort of a, uh, a story that can line up with tidally with a mental health message. Because mental health is important. I can tell you that I myself deal with difficult mental health days. I can tell you I myself have felt driven out of my mind because I grew up knowing that the body that I was in was not the ideal body. Too brown, too tall. Brain doesn't work the way everybody else's brain works. And I have twisted myself into many shapes to try to be appeasing, acceptable, lovable, okay. And it has only served to strip away the goodness that God put into me. It has only served to estrange me from myself. So yes, mental health is important. We could, if we wanted to, dispense with the miracle altogether and just say, well, Jesus is healing, let us be healing. And that would be a timely message, but there is a miracle here. There is a miracle here, and there's a reason that I'm up here denouncing patriarchy on Father's Day. I'm sorry, I do recognize the irony there, but it's important because none of us, men, women, black, white, indigenous, neurotypical, neurodiverse, able-bodied, differently abled, disabled, none of us are served in a world where there is us and there is them, and we let the demons roam around silently None of us are served where each person can't bring the fullness of who they are to the body. That hurts us all. And so while some feel scared to let go of power, we know that earthly power, power over, is nothing compared to the power with that God offers us when we are in our right mind, in our right self. I think this is shown to us by the Father, our Holy Parent. It's demonstrated by the Son. The Holy Spirit advocates for us to cross boundaries and topple systems, demonic systems, because in the presence of God, evil is driven out. In the presence of light and truth, darkness recedes. And so I call out, as the psalmist called out, O oh God, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them be our guide. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Church, what I truly pray for, for all of us, is that we will take care of each other, that we will really show up and see each other, 
that we will be willing to be uncomfortable with the message that perhaps holds us accountable for systems that harm others and that invites us into the dismantling of said systems so that people, all people can thrive. This is the work of God, I truly believe that. And so, let us take care of each other. Let's set our hearts upon a world where all my friends, all of us can really rest, can just be. Let us move through this day persistent in the labors of freedom because this is good work and good trouble to get into. May it be so. Amen. We're going to sing together, and I'm happy about it. So let's sing with our whole heart, O God of every nation. That's from Voices United 677. Rise as you are able. Seated. So the passing of the peace is, um, it's an ancient and transformative spiritual practice and it's survived for millennia actually through plague, through conflict. Sharing the peace began as a way for people in the Christian community to be reconciled to one another, often before making their offerings at the altar or before receiving communion. And I know that we've been through a lot with COVID. Um, and I see some folks are masked and some folks aren't, and that's okay. 
and I see that uh, you know everyone has different comfort levels. So we are going to offer the peace to one another, but know that there are many ways to do that. You can do it with a wave, with a bow, elbow bumps. Still, I think we can still do those. Uh, we can place our hands over our hearts as a sign of love and receive and give love that way with a neighbor. Or if we feel called and safe, uh, we can offer consensual hugs only, no non-consensual hugging uh, or handshakes. So please, uh, I offer to each one of you, church, may the peace of Christ be ever upon you. And now please share that peace with your neighbor. All right, there's going to be a bigger visiting time later, but thank you. I feel the peaceful vibrations and peace to everyone at home. May the peace of Christ be with you. And so now we come to the time of our offering. Now, we know that most of the people nowadays do offerings online. Many people do par and other things, but you are also welcome, I believe, to still leave your envelopes at the back. Um, and so I just want to ask you to bring that spirit of generosity into your hearts, whether you've given uh, before or you're giving for the first time. And let's just pray together. There are long histories of power working on our spirits every day. They persuade us to turn against one another, to maintain legacies of discrimination, and to protect what we have at the expense of others. But through Christ, we experience freedom, freedom to love, freedom to live differently, freedom to create a community of faith that is committed to collective well-being. And so with the trust that God can make it so among us, let us share what we have with each other. Living Christ, free our spirits of any kernel of revenge and cruelty. Direct us instead towards collective repair and right action. When we feel ourselves slipping into apathy and despair, place your hands on either side of our face and gaze upon us with your connecting love. Bless our offerings this day to our hard-earned hope toward everyday resurrection. 
Amen. Amen. I offer now prayers for the people, prayers for the community. And I speak a um, traditional Native American prayer. Oh. <clears throat> oh, great spirit, whose voice we hear in the winds and whose breath gives life to all the world, hear us now. We come before you as your children. We are small and weak. We need your strength and wisdom. Let us walk in beauty and make our eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. May our hands respect the things you have made. May our ears be sharp to hear your voice. Make us wise that we may know the things you have taught your people, the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. We seek strength, not to be superior to our siblings, but to live in harmony with ourselves and all your creation. Help us to be ever ready to come to you so that when life fades as a fading sunset, our spirits may come to you without any shame. God, we know that you know our hearts better than we even know ourselves. And so we lift up to you now the prayers that are on our hearts, the names of those who we hold dear, who are struggling, who need comfort, who need resilience, who need your blessing. And we also offer the prayers that are so deep within us that they have not yet come to form words. Grant for us the way that is true. Mark our path with your light so that we may not feel lost. Show us the direction in which we are to follow you. Lifting up all prayers, spoken and unspoken. I pray on behalf of this community here, the Lord's Prayer as shared by a New Zealand prayer book. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echoes through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the earth. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Time for announcements. So um, the first announcement is that uh, there is a still a donation drive that's happening for the Aboriginal Friendship Center that's continuing. And so gently used jeans, hoodies, jackets, tents, and shoes are much appreciated for those who are living rough. This Wednesday uh, at Northminster, just drop in between 1.30 and 3 p.m if you want to help yourself to some free bread that has uh, been baked by local businesses. And participating in that helps to reduce food waste and uh, means that it won't be thrown out. So that's a good thing. Daily bread. And uh, I also invite you to mark your calendars now for a sunset swim that's going to happen on the evening of July 18th. 
So come out and swim, or you can just sit in your lawn chair and visit with the other people that will be there. And uh, I believe the fourth announcement is by this lovely lady here, Brenda, our uh, council chair for St. David's. yet? There I am. Um, last summer, our Amy came to us, so highly recommended by Kathy and Bill, ministry and personnel here at St. David's. And as I was pondering what I was going to say this morning, as we recognize Amy's time with us, a favorite hymn came to mind. She comes sailing on the wind her wings flashing in the air. On a, <clears throat> okay, so here's where I choke up. On a journey just begun, she flies on. And in the passage of her flight, her song rings out through the night, full of laughter, full of light. She flies on. <laughs> Amy is flying on. And we're so excited about her future as she completes her requirements for ordination. Prior to Christmas, we saw Amy occasionally. I criticize people when they turn from the mic and turn around and do things like that. Prior to Christmas, we saw Amy occasionally from the pulpit. But it wasn't until... <laughs> there you go, sweetheart. It wasn't until January, February, and March that her light really shone. Her spirit filled the place during her series in February and March as she led us through the season of Lent and up to our new partnership with Reverend Nancy Norris and uh, Northminster United. And for those of us, and I see you here this morning, <coughs> who have joined Amy on Zoom Wednesday mornings, she's built a lo loyal following of St. Davidians who I'm sure will follow and support her during her upcoming challenges. We love you, Amy, and we wish you God's richest blessings today and always. Get up here so I can hug you. Can I hug you and then take the hug first? So our, our Amy drew attention to us this morning for the, what it says on her t-shirt, in case you wondered, she's a product of grace. I know you won't believe it because I'm a preacher, but I actually don't like that attention. <laughs> um, but thank you. I'm really grateful, honestly, that my time at St. David's has been amazing. And uh, I've learned uh, a lot about my voice and a lot about my ministry. And uh, I've had really um, wonderful relationships with the people here and with my coworkers. So I'm, it wasn't an easy decision to move on, but uh, thank you. And so we'll continue worshiping. I want to offer a commissioning for us today and, um, and say this. It is imperative that we name the demon, as that wise grandfather, grandmother, uh, told us. Because without that, there is no healing. We have to name this. this our scripture tells us this clearly again and again. And so, church, it is important that we also name the healer the God that our spirit longs for as a deer longs for the stream. So we must also remember that the healer dwells in us. We can never be too caught up in lament or in joy. We have to balance those things out. And so someone who I think did that beautifully is a man named Howard Thurman. And I've read him before to many of you. Um, but he could really be in every service and wouldn't be overused. Um, such a wise theologian and mystic. And so as we remember that the healer dwells in us, I offer this. It's a paraphrase of Howard Thurman's words. 
Let there be think times when things of beauty stir you so deeply. Sunlight pouring into a city alleyway, moonlight upon the water of a still lake. May what is in you that responds to beauty recognize this. May you fall in love with that part of yourself because it is the beauty which unites us. So let us be thankful. Let us stop to reflect upon the finest acts ever performed by any person you have ever known. That in them which caused them to perform these acts, let us revere what that thing is. And let us remember when something within you has caused such a creative and wholehearted act that you could be amazed by your own goodness. Because this is love. And so let us, for the total of all the good acts performed throughout the entirety of history, let us give our thanks. We're going to sing our closing hymn, which is, In Christ There Is No East or West. So rise as you are able and let us sing together. Through the witnessing of beauty, may we encounter wonder. Through the tenderness of kind relationships, may we experience care. In our anger over injustice, may we connect with our courageous action. In all the ordinary aches and joys of being alive, the presence of God is with you. So go in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. And there's a sending out song. Yeah? Hit it. <laughs>